Welcome everyone to Aaron's Audio Corner. This is your host, Aaron, the man. Oh, so corny. Anyway, I uh, I am reviewing the Dayton MK602X bookshelf speaker. It's 150 bucks. You can buy it directly from Parts Express. It is a Dayton audio design. And I must tell you that Dayton sent out this pair to me to review, but they requested that I return the speaker back before I had the opportunity to take some photos of my own and also take the speaker apart to provide you with some guts. And unfortunately that means that I just have some stock photos on my website and that's just kind of the way it is. With that said, I'll go ahead and tell you kind of the, the stuff up front that you'll want to know. Uh, number one, I really just, I didn't care for the speaker. The treble is boosted about 5 dB over the entire mean sensitivity of the speaker, which means that it's a very bright sounding speaker. And anecdotally, I've spoken with a couple friends who either have bought the speaker since they were just released a week or so ago, or one other fellow was loaned a set to review and their sentiments are pretty much the same, that it's just way too bright on the top end. Uh, probably a simple resistor in the tweeter would just knock that top end down a little bit, but they still have some directivity issues due to the, what appears to be just a, uh, 60 B per octave slope for the low pass filter on the mid woofer. And with that said, you know, there are some other things that I'll be honest that I'm not too fond of that are on the Dayton's. Uh, marketing page and I'm not really one to call out companies or anything like that and I, I hope that this doesn't come across that way but it's something that stands out to me in contrast to what I'm seeing in the data and what I heard and my job is to provide you with information and I would feel like I wasn't doing a proper job if I didn't kind of address these concerns that I personally have with what Dayton has on the website and if the folks from Dayton are watching this which you know, they didn't see my review beforehand. They Nobody ever gets to see my stuff beforehand. Uh, you know, if you guys from Dayton are watching, I maybe would encourage you to reconsider some of the things that you have on your webpage as far as the marketing goes. And what do I mean about that? Okay, well, let's just take a look. Now, right now we're on the Parts Express website and, you know, you've, you've got the, the speaker. You say six inch glass fiber, woofer, one inch silk dome tweeter. And that's all fine and dandy. Let's go ahead and get to the bottom though. Uh, more than a pretty face. Yeah, you know, it's a nice overall aesthetic. Uh, no real issues there for me personally. It does come with a grill, and I think the grill is, is a nice grill. But the things that I really personally have an issue with in regards to their product page is this part where it says the tweeter is detailed, not distracting, uh, designed for long-term listening sessions. The silk dome tweeter in the MK602 was selected for its low distortion and uniform dispersion characteristics. I'm a Blow this up a little bit more. Uh, Well-behaved, off-axis response, and excellent dispersion. We'll talk about that. The, they're less critical to position than most loudspeakers. Okay, but th this thing, the long-term listening sessions. Well, let's just go ahead and, and skip over to the data real fast and, and see what we, what we have there. Now, all of my testing is done with the Eclipple Near Field Scanner. It is a state-of-the-art uh, analysis... I hate to call it a tool. It's, it's much more than a tool, but it's a big robot that allows you to measure speakers in a non-anechoic environment, but get anechoic data from that. And the reason that's important is because you want to separate the speaker from the room for measurement purposes to better understand how a speaker is more likely to perform in your room. And with anechoic data, you can get a better idea of what speaker is going to be best for you if you've looked at enough data and you've been able to draw good correlations, which... That's really what I'm trying to do with my data is to help you all out understand what it is you like or what you don't like based on your past experiences. Let's see here. And we're going to go ahead and look at the spinorama data. Now, if you don't know what this data means, I really don't have the time to get to it into, into, into it in this review. So I will put a link in the card up here. You can read or you can watch the playlist about how to uh, understand the data. We're going to look at a few things right now. The black line is the on-axis response. The dash green line is the listening window. The listening window is about plus or minus 30 degrees to the side, plus or minus 10 degrees up and down. And that usually gives you a good idea of how the speaker is going to sound for most seated positions because 
you may not be able to line up the speaker directly on axis, but more than likely you're going to try to. So the on axis response, there's a big kick up of about, like I said, about plus five dB, depending on where you're looking at over the mean sensitivity, which the mean sensitivity is about 85 dB. So at, what is this, 3K, you're about plus one, 5K, you're about plus two, eight plus four or so in this area. And then 10K, you're at about plus five dB to uh, 16 kilohertz. Overall, it's what I would consider, and I think most would consider a bright sounding speaker. So why am I talking about this? Well, let's go back again. Designed for a long-term listening sessions, they call detailed. All right, so this is my concern with these kind of marketing things. There's a lot of people that when they hear a bright tweeter, at first they think, wow, that's really detailed. And I I do that too my, myself. I mean, I'm, I perfectly fall victim to that plenty of times. So as you listen a little bit more, and I'm not talking days, I'm talking maybe a few more songs, right? You start to think, well, maybe that's not detailed. It, it makes you go, oof, like kind of cringe at certain songs. You know, it's just a little bit bright as, as most people would would call it. And then we talk about the long-term listening sessions. And I can tell you within about five minutes, I was over the speaker. I just was, I was not enjoying it. It was just too treble heavy for my taste. And you think, well, what if I turn it off axis? You know, what, what happens then? Well, this is where the directivity index data falls in line. As you turn the speaker off axis and it spreads more energy to different places in the room relative to where you were pointed, uh, the off axis response, we'll go down here and look at the horizontal. You know, it tracks the on-axis response pretty good in the tweeter region, but you see that there's some discontinuity here as you go between the midwoofer and to the tweeter, and that really shows up here in the early directivity. Man, I really need a new mouse. Okay. And the early direct early reflections directivity. Uh, when you get to about two kilohertz, you're not so much beaming in the midwoofer anymore. Now you've got this drop, and it's a pretty significant drop of almost four or five dB in directivity between the midwoofer and the tweeter. Well, what does that mean? That means as the midwoofer is becoming more directional, it's staying more directional, a little bit higher in frequency. And when the tweeter is introduced to the crossover network, now the tweeter is playing omnidirectionally. So you've got a pretty, pretty big mismatch in the sound radiation pattern of the speaker as you go from on axis to off axis. And why does that matter to you? Well, Whatever sound you're spraying into the room is being reflected off the side walls, off the ceiling, off the floor, and coming back toward you. And in doing so, you really want to try to have the reflected sounds be very close, very similar to the sounds that you hear directly on axis. Because if you don't, then those basically, you know, kind of counteract what you're hearing on axis. You're, you're going to hear that difference. And that's essentially what you get when you have different sounds spread out into the room versus what you're hearing when the speaker is firing directly at you. So that's why we prefer generally to have this dash blue line or even this red line to be linear. You know, it can either be flat or it can be sloped one way, but as, as long as it's constant, that's kind of the ideal directivity pattern. And you can certainly see that this speaker does not have that directivity pattern. Now there are a few things to note. We have some resonances here. At about 900 hertz, it uh, looks like maybe another one around, and I don't know if that's so much a resonance or not, uh, but this 900 hertz one, that, that one kind of caught my attention. And that appears to be from the enclosure itself. I don't know if it's sidewall vibration or what, but I did do some near field testing. I showed some sound leaking out of the port at around that frequency, but based on my experience with a lot of speakers this size, more than likely it's not port issue it's more than likely an actual resonance of the enclosure itself. And the interesting thing to note, and let's go down and look at that near field data. Okay. So the black line is the anechoic on axis response. The red is the midwoofer and note how shallow this slope is, right? So they're using uh, just maybe like a roughly a 60 B per octave slope, but then you've got this peak right here. And then you've got this other peak right here, a smaller one right here. And these correspond to the on-axis response. And these are measured from the port. Now, again, I want to stress that even though they're measured from the port, doesn't mean that they're caused by the port. More than likely, it's just internal resonance is leaking out through the port, and it's just easier to measure that way. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because 
normally you would want to have a midwoofer that isn't cross with such a shallow slope at such a low frequency. You ideally would want it to go out a little bit further in response and then have a steeper slope. But I find it really interesting that it's a shallow slope. And it, basically what I'm getting to is I wonder if they didn't target the shallow slope, A, because it saves them money on components, but B, because maybe they knew the enclosure was resonating and they thought, well, hey, let's use the enclosure resonance to our advantage and save some money on the components. And that's that's fine, but the problem still is that that doesn't resolve the directivity index mismatch. Now here we have the on-axis linearity, and this is the same thing as what you saw above, but it's just laid out a little bit easier to follow where you can see kind of the plus or minus one and a half dB and the plus or minus three dB window for the speaker to get an idea of just how linear it is. We can see that the F3 is at 72 hertz, and we can see that the F10 is 43 hertz, which means that at 43 hertz, the speaker is down 10 decibels. And I'm pointing that out because if we go back to their website, they say, felt and heard, do I need a sub? Now, when I saw this, I thought, surely you're not about to tell me I don't need a sub for the speaker, but... They say probably not, and here's why. The high excursion of this woofer extends low frequencies and lowers distortion at higher output. 10 dB down at 43 hertz, 3 dB down at 72 hertz. You know, 3 dB down at 72 hertz is, is reasonable, and 10 dB down at 43 hertz is reasonable, but when you tell me that I'm probably not gonna need a subwoofer, to me, that's stepping a bit too far. I feel like if the F3 was like 60 hertz or something like that, or man, even 50 hertz, you know, then sure, yeah, you could probably get by without a subwoofer for most music. And you gotta think too that, let's just see, are they talking about theater in here? Okay, good, they don't actually specify home theater, so that's good. Uh, you gotta think though too that if you're probably a plan on using this for a theater room, uh, you're still gonna need a sub for sure because there's a lot of content below that 50 hertz, 60 hertz region and I wouldn't recommend these speakers playing much lower than that with significant output. Now that's just based on what I'm seeing and what I heard in my room. And they say the woofer, what is it, lowers distortion at higher output. So we'll check that. Okay, at 86 dB, you're below 1%. And actually you're below 1% all the way down to 50 Hertz. That's pretty good for a bookshelf speaker of this size. And then at 96 dB, you know, you, you start to ramp up in distortion. That's not really a surprise so much. And I think that I don't really have a problem with their statement so much. It's just that the implication of it being able to capture subwoofer frequencies is, uh, that's an overstep on, in my opinion. I'm gonna pull aside from looking at their marketing literature because again, I don't wanna seem like I'm just coming down on them crazy hard. It's just, I don't like it. I, I don't like some of the things they said and I feel like it's maybe a bit misleading if, if not more. And then. You know, I don't know. I know the folks at Dayton probably aren't going to like that assessment, but that's just honestly how I feel. And I'm here for the viewer, not for the manufacturer. Okay. Now, in this case, we're going to look at the horizontal response in normalized view. Now, I typically do this in a different manner, but I think in this case, with the shallow slope of the midwoofer, it's best served to look at this speaker in this light. And what I'm looking for here is a smooth transition from the midwoofer to the tweeter. And you know, it's, it's, it's reasonably smooth, that's not great. When you get to the one kilohertz area, you flatten out to about plus or minus 50 degrees, but then you jump back up, and this jump back up is actually where the uh, tweeter comes into play, and that's about plus or minus 60 to 70 degrees, depending on which particular line you're looking at here. So it's about maybe a 20 degree, 10 to 20 degree shift between the tweeter and the midwoofer as you make that transition through the crossover. And in vertical terms, normalized, uh, we see a hole below the speaker, we see a hole above the speaker. And really what this is just telling you is it's not a surprise. If you want the best listening position, sit on axis with the tweeter with your ears level with the tweeter. I think most anybody would probably figure that out. Now let's talk about output capability. This is my test to evaluate performance going from lower volume to higher volume from 76 dB as the reference point to 86, 96, and 102 dB. Now in this graphic, we have the red line, which indicates 76 to 86 dB, and there's really not much of a change through here. It's about half a dB 
until you get down below 50 hertz. So that's okay. That's not not terrible. Uh, the blue response is kind of the same thing, although it starts to show more variability. And this peaking, you know, around the two kilohertz, that could be uh, could be the tweeter, could be the resistors, could be the components in the crossover. I, I, I honestly don't know. When you go to 102 dB, which is really loud, especially for a bookshelf speaker, you can see a significant dip in the response between about 100 hertz to 200 hertz. And I think this is the first time I've seen such an event occur with a speaker like this. And basically what that means is you can't really push the speaker to insane levels and or listen to the speaker really far away and expect a lot of output volume without suffering some dynamic range limitations. Now that does it for my objective portion of the review. If you wanna read more and look at the data on your own time, you can do that. I'll drop the link down below. Uh, some things up, I guess, here's here's my take on it. I think Dayton could have done better. I wish they would have done better. I really don't understand why the tweeter is so high in level. It just doesn't really make sense to me. I am concerned with some of their marketing things on their product page, the detailed and non-fatiguing tweeter. That doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, the non-need, I guess, for a subwoofer or, or the probably not needing a subwoofer. That doesn't make sense on me, again, based on what I heard in my room and what I see in the data. In my room, these were best pulled out from the walls at about three feet from the front wall, which is very typical. It's got a rear port, so you can't put it right up next to a wall anyway. Uh, I would say that volume-wise, I got to about, I think it was 95 dB at four meters or three and a half meters before the woofer was just given out. And that's not really a surprise there either. You cannot fix the directivity issue with equalization. You would actually need a new crossover network for that. And maybe maybe Dayton will see how these products sell. And, and if a lot of people don't like it, then yeah, they'll revisit it. But I don't know, that's, that's what I've got for now. And I hope you appreciate it. I hope you've actually learned something from this. And I hope it helps you make the right purchase decision for your needs. And with that said, I am out. Oh, and by the way, if you like the video, if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please hit the subscribe and the like button and all that cool stuff that you normally do. That definitely helps me out here at this channel. And uh, I do have a Patreon. If you want to check the link below, that would be cool. So for real, I'm out. I hope y'all guys have a good one. Peace.